Hi there, this is Dr. Zach Watkins, and today what we're going to talk about is the importance of gluten and gluten-free diets. Now, there's no more contention around any health issue than the subject of how to choose foods that are right for you. People who want to eat healthy, nutritious foods are frequently confused about what to do. Many follow what they assume are healthy diets with the best intentions, only to unwillingly be causing health problems by eating foods that are harmful to them. Now, the following discussion of this complex and misunderstood issue provides a starting point for making sensible food choices based on science, not just opinions. And the focus of this discussion will be on food intolerance and food allergies, with a special emphasis on the newly discovered condition referred to as subclinical or hidden gluten intolerance. The purpose of this discussion is to help you understand the importance of eating foods that are well tolerated and to teach the value of avoiding those foods that can lead to health problems down the road. Now when it comes to eating the right foods, it is difficult for even the most well-educated person to understand all the different opinions presented by doctors, nutritionists, fitness experts, magazine articles, the internet, etc. And it is clear that there is little to no consensus on what constitutes a healthy diet or how to go about choosing foods wisely. There are dozens of diets to help a person lose weight, enhance athletic performance, or incorporate foods such as soy products to help with hormone imbalance. In fact, there are diets for every imaginable purpose, but sorting through the contradictory advice has become so challenging that many people simply just give up. Each week the media reports more and more information about the beneficial aspects of certain foods and the harmful attributes. Even the official government recommendations and the new food pyramid has replaced the old four food groups. The challenge is to wade through all the available information and find what is right for each of us as individuals. Now first and foremost, any diet related advice must be based on sound physiological principles, not on personal experiences or preferences, current fads or product marketing. Science can guide us in terms of explaining the basic requirements for normal human physiology and function when it comes to how to eat. Additionally, there are sophisticated laboratory tests available that screen for food intolerance and for food allergies to determine what specific foods are right for you. These lab tests can be used by anyone seeking to determine reliable, science-based dietary recommendations. We need to come to an understanding of the basic physiological principles around food and diet that apply to all of us. Scientists have known for decades that proper blood sugar control is absolutely required for maintenance of appropriate fat levels, to have good cognition function, and to stimulate healthy immune function. We also must investigate what specific foods are harmful and which foods are well tolerated and health promoting for our unique body chemistry. Now subclinical or hidden gluten intolerance is a health problem at epidemic proportions in certain populations in the United States and remains largely unrecognized by conventional medicine. Gluten is a protein found in grains like wheat, barley, rye, and even some oats. It is found in the matured seed of these grasses and is responsible for the elastic texture of dough. If you eat bread, cakes, cookies, crackers, pastries, pancake mix, well, you're basically eating gluten. But what is in the harm of that? Why are so many people jumping on the bandwagon of eliminating it from their diet? And why do I, personally as a practitioner, recommend it in my practice for health, support, and rejuvenation? Well, let's define subclinical intolerance versus a disease like celiac disease. Now, subclinical intolerance means, or subclinical means hidden. In other words, there are often no obvious symptoms that would direct a doctor or patient to suspect subclinical conditions. Since symptoms aren't obvious and subclinical gluten intolerance often goes undiagnosed or even misdiagnosed, many people can suffer from the health consequences related to subclinical gluten intolerance without understanding the true cause of their problems. By their very nature, subclinical problems are hard to recognize and frequently go undetected despite the best efforts of health professionals and patients. Now, what's the relationship to celiac disease? Well, subclinical gluten intolerance is often confused with a medical condition called celiac disease, or celiac sprue, or non-tropical sprue. 
sometimes referred to as gluten enteropathy or gluten intolerance. A lot of names here. Now, the reaction to gluten in celiac disease is similar to subclinical gluten intolerance, except as to the degree of intensity. Comparing subclinical gluten intolerance to celiac disease is like comparing first degree sunburn from a day at the beach to a third degree burn from a fire victim. You can see they both are burns, but vastly different based on the severity or degree of damage. Celiac disease is not hidden or subclinical, and as such, it is easier to diagnose. A person with celiac disease may have blood in their stool or experience disabling pain when they consume gluten-containing foods. Other symptoms of celiac disease include undigested and unabsorbed fat in the stool and skin problems, um, eczema, even things like hypothyroidism. Now these condition or obvious symptoms often lead doctors to recognize those with celiac in childhood when the grains are first introduced into their diet. Others with celiac disease are not really diagnosed until the adult years. Now in addition to the clinical presentation, Celiac disease can be detected by a blood test and confirmed with a biopsy of the small intestine. The clear signs and symptoms of celiac disease make, it, make its identification relatively straightforward, whereas subclinical gluten intolerance, however, is pretty difficult to diagnose based on symptoms alone. Now what exactly is subclinical gluten intolerance? Subclinical gluten intolerance refers to exposure to the gliadin molecule and to a specific inflammatory reaction taking place in the small intestine of, of afflicted individuals. The gliadin or gliadin is a polypeptide, which is a long chain amino acid, which is present in the gluten protein portion of certain grains. The subject gets confusing and there is much misinformation about gluten and gliadin. To clarify, gliadin is the molecule that causes the problem and it's present in some, but not all, gluten-containing foods. People with this problem must avoid glutens from the grains of wheat, rye, barley, kamut, uh, spelt, teff, and even couscous. Some of these grains have lower concentrations of both gluten and gliadin than wheat does, but any food containing this specific protein, even from a lower concentration food source, is not well tolerated by people with subclinical gluten intolerance. This dietary restriction eliminates bread, pasta, bagels, cereals, you know, all of the good stuff. And, but there are rice and almond-based breads available, usually found in the refrigerated section of the local health food store. And there are also rice, yam, corn-based noodles, and cereals, crackers, and other gluten-free substitutes on the market. All right, now what, what about safe glutens? Are there safe glutens? Well, rice, corn, oats, buckwheat, and millet have glutens, but the glutens in these foods do not claim the protein gliadin, the molecule that can provoke the inflammatory reaction. Therefore, they're usually safe. Other safe grains include quinoa, amaranth. In some cases, people are allergic to rice, corn, oats, or millet, independent of the reaction of that gluten particle. Reading the labels, of the food can be very misleading. Now don't trust them. Some companies list their products as gluten-free without understanding the scientific basis of the problem with that protein gliadin. For clarity of communication, subclinical gluten intolerance will be used to refer to the sensitivity to gliadin and the rest of this discussion. What about soy? Soybeans are another food to which many people with gliadin intolerance react. It is best to avoid all concentrated forms of soy protein, such as soy protein powders, tofu, and tempeh, while you are first eliminating gliadin, and then to reintroduce it back into the diet at a later time to see how reactive you are to soy. Even though soy has gotten a lot of attention in terms of its ability to help women with hormonal imbalances and bone loss, this does not hold true for those women who are gluten intolerant as soy can actually cause inflammation and ultimately exacerbate hormonal imbalances and accelerate bone loss. So soy products can be very helpful in women who tolerate gliadin and have no allergy to soy. But much of the original research on the benefits of soy comes from Japan and China where gluten intolerance is not as common as it is in the United States. 
Additionally, the traditional diet of these Asian countries is rich in foods that can help balance the negative issues associated with soy consumption. So if you have subclinical gluten intolerance, what are you going to eat, right? As already mentioned, rice, corn, millet, quinoa, amaranth, oats, and even buckwheat are okay. Now, unless you're allergic, of course. There has been some data about whether or not oats are quote-unquote safe. And while they do contain a small amount of gluten, it usually does affect most gluten-sensitive people and can therefore be tolerated unless one experiences adverse symptoms. With subclinical gluten intolerance, you can also safely eat any type of meat or poultry, you know, including chicken, turkey, beef, pork, lamb, and even fish such as salmon. Any kind of vegetable and any type of fruit is okay. As are most beans, and as explained or mentioned before, soybeans may be a problem though. Well, most people don't really feel better immediately after they eliminate this gluten from their diet. You know, as it can take possibly up to 60 days for inflammation in your GI tract to subside and even up to 9 to 12 months for the lining of the small intestines to heal. On rare occasions, an individual may experience significant improvement within weeks of beginning on a gluten-free diet. In certain cases, people may feel considerably worse upon initially starting the gluten-free diet. Now, for most people with this food intolerance, by around 6 to 9 months of being gluten-free, noticeable changes have taken place. So let's talk about the physiological effects of subclinical gluten intolerance. Now following are some of the physiological changes that result from subclinical gluten intolerance. In those with subclinical gluten intolerance, the gliadin protein causes what's called a mucotoxic or just an inflammatory reaction as it comes into contact with the wall of the small intestines. This reaction usually goes unnoticed at first. In fact, this low-grade inflammation may go undetected for years or even decades before it results in the expression of symptoms. The ultimate effect of this hidden wear and tear is the slow destruction of the healthy GI tract lining, and in some cases there may be symptoms in childhood such as allergies, asthma, or even recurring stomach infections, a constant upset stomach, or even milk intolerance. Often these symptoms fade in the early adult years only for the problem to reappear when a person is between 35 and 55 years of age. Now what is inflammation? We get this gluten and we have this low-grade inflammation, may be undetected for years, but what does that mean for us? What is, what is the problem or damage that can be caused from inflammation? Well, inflammation means to set on fire or to flame within. Now this setting on fire is a literal description of the actual destructive process gluten initiates. Inflammation is your body's way of reacting to injury. When exposed to gliadin, the inflamed small intestine undergoes significant structural changes. Inflammation is a familiar experience to everyone. For example, the reaction of the sinuses during a bad cold or flu is an inflammatory reaction. Other examples of inflammation are from the response to physical trauma, like pain from a low back injury or from hitting your thumb with a hammer. In all these situ situations, the inflammatory response is activated. This response is the body's attempt to repair tissue damage and prevent infections by quickly bringing our own internal 911 response team to the injury site. The physiological protection includes the immediate activation of a complex system that takes place regardless of the initial source of inflammation. The purpose of this physiological mechanism is to handle the insult whether it is physical trauma, a viral or bacterial infection, or the gliadin molecule that we talked about before, but only those who are sensitive, of course. In each case, the body attempts to remove the harmful substance and quickly control the damage that has been caused. With the reaction to gluten in the gastrointestinal tract, initially there will be heat, redness, swelling, and importantly, a change or interruption in the normal function of the small intestine. On the cellular level, a series of events takes place, including dilation or enlargement of blood vessels with increased permeability and blood flow. This brings more blood to the site of injury to provide greater protection in the form of white blood cells and other immune system cells. This is also called an exudation, or leaking of fluids from the blood vessels into the tissues with an accompanying swelling. This is followed by movement of white blood cells into the tissues for enhanced immune protection. 
And additionally, there's also fibrin formation. Fibrin is a thin white filament structure that aids in the physical repair process. We're all familiar with fibrin and its role in helping blood clot, but in this case, fibrin helps plug up any areas of the intestinal wall that require structural support. 12 to 14 hours after this series of physiological reactions, the body's response to the gliadin fades, provided there is no further exposure. And at this point, the physical regeneration and repair process can begin. Now, if you eat gluten again, the gliadin exposure is repeated, and there is no let-up of this whole inflammatory cascade, and the damage to the lining of the small intestine continues. Now, assuming there is no further exposure, the blood vessels return to the normal size and normal blood flow is reestablished. Then, the protective white blood cells degenerate or re-enter the blood circulation and cellular disintegration or peripheralization takes place in which injured cells are replaced and swelling disappears with resorption of the tissue fluid and the breakdown of the fibrin. This 911 response team clean up, cleans up, packs up, goes back to wait for the next emergency call. And under the normal, or normal conditions, the inflammatory response eliminates the insult and removes the injured tissue components. And this process accom accomplishes either regeneration of the normal tissue architecture and return of the physiologic function or the formation of scar tissue to replace what cannot be repaired. And this whole sequence of events can take place each time a gluten-sensitive individual eats gluten-containing foods. That was a lot, but just think how this process very detailed process happens every time someone who's gluten sensitive eats that particle or eats that protein. And this is what we talk about in my office that drives inflammation. And when we drive inflammation, it hurts our stress hormone cortisol. Now this inflammatory reaction goes largely unnoticed simply because it is not severe enough to cause immediate symptoms. If a gluten intolerant person eats gluten containing foods, for extended periods of time, over and over again, the low-grade inflammation can lead to a variety of problems. With long-term exposure, the results of this low-grade response to the gluten molecule can be devastating to a variety of body systems. Its effect on the digestive system is the most immediate. Okay, so we talked about gluten and uh, gliadin, the particle that can cause digestive inflammation. Um, but what does this have to really do with digestive health overall? So good health requires proper digestion and absorption. Digestion is the mechanical and chemical breakdown of the food we eat. As food is digested, it needs to be absorbed, and absorption is the process of bringing the nutrients from our gastrointestinal tract into the rest of our body's tissue. Digestion is initiated when we chew food and begin to break it down with digestive enzymes. Food then enters the stomach, where further breakdown occurs from the presence of stomach acid called hydrochloric acid and pepsin, which together begin the breakdown of proteins. From the stomach, the products of digestion enter the small intestine. Now the small intestine is called small because it is smaller in diameter than the large intestine. However, it is in fact longer and in many ways more crucial to our health than the large intestine. The lining of the small intestine consists of villi, which are like finger-like projections that stick out from the wall of the intestine into the lumen, or basically the center of the intestine. I described this as like a shag carpet. Your GI lining has these finger projections which actually look like a shag carpet. Now these villi are between one half and one and a half millimeters long, just barely visible to the human eye. On the end of these villi are actually microvilli sometimes referred to as the brush border. These two adaptations, villi, microvilli, increase the surface absorption area of the small intestine to about up to 1,000 fold. It's actually been estimated that the entire absorptive area of the small intestine is roughly the size of a basketball court. Now this total area for absorption can be compromised by any condition that irritates the lining of the small intestine. In gluten intolerance, there is a destructive or a destruction of the villi, referred to as villus atrophy. Basically, you're breaking down that shag carpet, and this leads to poor digestive function and affects many vital structures on the intestinal wall. Poor intestinal function caused by improper digestion of food is referred to as maldigestion 
or basically what it means is bad digestion. Inadequate absorption of nutrients is called malabsorption, or the ability to get the vital nutrients your body needs delivered to your cells. So takeaway basically is that the more that your GI system has an irritant, like gluten, the ability to absorb is compromised, so therefore we can't soak up or absorb those nutrients as efficiently as we could, therefore suffering from nutrient uh, deficiencies, abnormalities, and this is common what we see in celiac disease. So one system significantly impacted by maldigestion and malabsorption in the small intestine is the hormonal system. I have treated hundreds of gluten intolerant patients whose indigestion problems were misdiagnosed as heartburn, irritable bowel syndrome, and who suffer from chronic bloating and gas. Subclinical gluten intolerance creates a significant stress on the immune system and can lead to a compromised immune system. The mechanism of action occurs in several different ways. There are specialized immune cells that line the small intestine called immunocytes. These immune cells produce secretory IgA, which is a critical component of the thin, healthy mucus that, is, that makes up your first line immune defense. The inflammatory process produces individuals that are gluten sensitive, destroys a certain percentage of these cells. And this in turn can lower your immune system or immune defense, thereby opening the door to intestinal infections. Through this mechanism, parasites, bacteria, viruses, and even yeast or candida, or basically what's called fungus, can more easily infect someone who is gluten intolerant and suffering from a weakened first-line immune defense. This lowered immune defense is referred to as a depressed secretory IgA and can result in many other food reactions. This is because the secretory IgA, or the immune system, also helps the body process food antigens. Food antigens can create significant health problems. An antigen is a marker that is recognized by our immune system as okay or not okay. Antigens mark substances as foreign to the human body. The recognition of what is an okay antigen and what is not an okay antigen allows our immune system to attack and destroy harmful substances. So for example, when you have a viral infection like the common cold, the viruses that infect us have antigen markers on their outer surface, and our immune system recognizes these antigens and makes antibodies to destroy the virus. Food is also a foreign particle to the body and therefore has antigens. Typically, we don't react to food antigens. However, in some people, food reactions do occur because of inappropriate response of the immune system to antigens in food. Other people may be sensitive to pollen antigens antigens or mold antigens and have reactions to these substances. The overall weakening or depression of our first line immune defense, again called secretory IgA in our GI tract, makes us more susceptible to antigens of all kinds and can make a person highly reactive to food antigens who might not otherwise have the problem. This is another link between gastrointestinal stress and the immune system. So another avenue through which subclinical gluten intolerance affects the human system or the immune system is through the inflammatory response. Many people have heard of corticosteroid medications such as prednisone or cortisone. Now they are used for a wide variety of medical purposes. Corticosteroid injections are used for joint and muscle injuries to reduce pain. Corticosteroid sprays and inhalers are used by people who suffer from asthma and allergies to improve the function of the airways. Well, our body also makes its own corticosteroids, the most abundant of which is called cortisol. It's a hormone. Now with chronic low-grade inflammation from gluten intolerance, or for that matter, any stress that inflames the digestive tract, like infections or other things, our bodies produce increased levels of this hormone cortisol. Since cortisol is also one of the major modulators of immune function, this suppresses our immune response. As a matter of interest, this immune-suppressing role of corticosteroids 
is used in medicine in certain circumstances when immune suppression is the goal. So like with organ transplants and in some serious autoimmune diseases, corticosteroids are used therapeutically to suppress immune function. However, in other certain sec uh, situations, this immune suppressing role of cortisol and corticosteroid medications works against our health. When cortisol production becomes abnormal, our hormonal and immune systems become affected. While elevated cortisol suppresses our immune response, it also causes a catabolic or breakdown state to exist in our body. And these kind of symptoms of a, what's called adrenal exhaustion will eventually appear. Things like fatigue, depression, loss of libido, allergies, and even frequent illness. There are other many connections between subclinical gluten intolerance and other intestinal problems. To describe this connection in more detail, we'll review the structure and function of the small intestine. Now, the small intestine is constructed like a tube. The inside of the tube is a healthy mucosal lining. Mucosal tissues also line the sinus patches ways, the lungs, and the urogenital tract, the mouth, and the throat. These lining tissues act as a vital barrier to defend the body from infectious organisms. The small intestine lining tissue also performs the crucial function of absorption of nutrients. Under chronic inflammatory stress, this healthy mucosal tissue breaks down and a condition called increased permeability, also known as leaky gut syndrome, occurs. Leaky gut syndrome refers to as uh, the loss of integrity of this mucosal or lining tissue. So having a leaky gut syndrome is like having a screen door with large holes in it that allows flies and other insects to get through. With leaky gut syndrome, the lining of your intestine becomes overly permeable and molecules that were not intended to cross into your bloodstream enter or leak in. And this leads to a great deal of immune stress as your body tries to handle all of these uninvited guests. So gluten reactions also cause other problems. There are structures called lacteals that are located in the tips of the villi, that was the uh, shag carpet, which can destroy or be destroyed by reactions to gluten. These lacteals are important and are responsible for helping in the absorption of fats by breaking them down into fine droplets. Now, if this process is compromised, it can result in poor absorption of healthy fats that are critical to your health. This depletes the body's source of fat-soluble nutrients, leading to essential fatty acid deficiencies, low levels of vitamin A and E. Even if taking them in supplements, the full benefit of fat-soluble nutrients will not be realized. Deficiencies of these nutrients deplete nutrients critical for the function of every cell in the body and negatively affects blood sugar control, nerve cell function, steroid hormone production, antioxidant formation, and many other processes. It is also common for people with subclinical gluten intolerance to develop blood sugar problems, sometimes referred to as syndrome X or metabolic syndrome. So the lack of normal absorption in the small intestine leads to predictable nutritional deficiencies. Calcium absorption can be poor, and this nutritional deficiency couple well, coupled with abnormal corticosteroid production can lead to accelerated osteoporosis. Iron, B12, folic acid deficiencies are also commonly observed. This can lead to fatigue, mild depression, memory loss, and greater risk for elevated homocysteine levels, which is a key factor in the development of heart disease. Poor digestive function leads to maldigestion and malabsorption of protein, and that will be reflected in amino acid deficiencies. Amino acids are the building blocks of our body and are vital for production of neurotransmitters such as serotonin. Low levels of amino acids results in low levels of neurotransmitters. Our brain utilizes many different chemical messengers called neurotransmitters to communicate. They are made from amino acids found in protein containing foods. Improper digestion and or absorption of protein generates amino acid deficiencies, which directly affect how we think and feel. The prevalence of this problem can be seen in numbers of people benefiting from Prozac and other antidepressant medications. This generation of antidepressants are called SSRIs, or Selective Serotonin Reuptake Inhibitors. These medications prevent your brain from reabsorbing the serotonin naturally produced so that you can experience higher serotonin levels. 
serotonin, the neurotransmitter, is manufactured from an amino acid. So therefore, a deficiency in amino acids can lead to a serotonin deficiency. And conversely, restoring normal amino acid levels can help restore normal serotonin levels. Now, if you either A, do not eat adequate protein, or B, cannot digest protein well, or C, cannot absorb the amino acids from protein, you will develop amino acid deficiencies that ultimately affect brain function and other body processes. This approach taken in natural therapies is to look for causative agents such as maldigestion and malabsorption and treat the cause of the deficiency directly, thereby improving the outcome. In this case, addressing dietary intake of protein, the ability to digest it with sufficient stomach acid and digestive enzymes, and the ability to absorb is critical to optimal health. In certain people who have food sensitivities, this one factor can prevent recovery from weight gain, fatigue, recurrent infections, and a cycle of chronic illness. Now, depending on the extent of the problem, a person may need to undergo extensive nutritional counseling to restore normal vitamin levels and minerals, amino acids, and other essential fatty acids. Natural therapies can be used with great success, providing the appropriate foods are being eaten and normal gastrointestinal function has been restored. So now I want to mention lactose intolerance. Lactose intolerance is defined as the inability to digest the carbohydrate portion of or portion of milk products. The carbohydrate portion of milk is referred to as lactose or milk sugar. Lactose intolerance frequently accompanies gluten intolerance. Lactase, a specialized enzyme that aids digestion of lactose in milk products, is usually lacking in people with subclinical gluten intolerance. Lactase breaks down lactose or milk sugar in the same way sucrase enzymes break down sugar or sucrose. Damage to the architecture of the intestinal wall and the subsequent decrease in enzymes for lactose and sucrose digestion leads to problems in digesting dairy products such as cheese, ice cream, and all types of milk products. This enzyme deficiency is why people with subclinical gluten intolerance need to avoid pasteurized cow's milk products. As the villi or the shag carpet on the intestinal lining heal from a gluten-free diet, most individuals will be able to tolerate raw or unpasteurized dairy products again in nine months to uh, a year in the future. In other people, there will be a more or less permanent sensitivity to dairy products. However, in the initial two months of eliminating gluten, it is absolutely required to avoid all milk dairy products because they will inflame the intestine lining, just like the protein gliadin does, and prevent healing. This includes the complete elimination of pasteurized milk products such as cheese, yogurt, cottage cheese, and milk. Goat's milk, yogurt, and goat's or uh, sheep's milk cheeses such as feta cheese and others are acceptable alternatives. In this instance, eggs are not considered as dairy products. Raw or unpasteurized dairy products are healing foods for the damaged GI tract lining. Now, some states you cannot find raw or unpasteurized dairy products, so uh, check with your state regulations and laws about that. Now, subclinical gluten intolerance often leads to the development of multiple delayed food allergies, leaky gut syndrome, and the accompanying premature leaking of food antigens into the bloodstream cause this. In time, this overexposure to food antigens causes the immune system to react, and foods that would otherwise be tolerated can become allergenic. Although the problem with food allergies is generated by the damage from gluten, removal of gluten and pasteurized dairy from the diet is not always sufficient to remedy this problem. So depending on your circumstances, your doctor or your provider may recommend a four to five day food rotation diet or food allergy testing. Also, there's many books available from the bookstore uh, on food rotation diets as well as the internet. Now there are different types of food allergies. Some are immediate, some are delayed. Immediate food allergies are usually easy to recognize. For example, you eat a strawberry, you get a rash. These don't usually require testing to determine. However, delayed food allergies are hard to identify because the reaction may not appear for hours or even days after eating the offending food. So for example, eating an, aller, uh, an allergic food on a Monday night could generate a migraine headache or cause fatigue on Tuesday or Wednesday. Due to this difficulty in identification, of delayed food allergies, one of two strategies should be followed. Now the first choice is to follow a rotation diet. 
By doing this, even though the exact foods you are allergic have not been identified, um, you'll be rotating all your foods so that any delayed allergenic response uh, or allergic response will be significantly reduced. So this reduces the stress on your hormonal, uh, uh, hormonal and immune system. The second option is to pursue additional testing for delayed food sensitivities. Multiple pathway food allergy testing is designed for this purpose. This testing is done from a blood sample and identifies exactly which foods you are reacting to. And then you'll know what foods to avoid and what foods are safe. So what's the difference between allergy and intolerance? Well, kind of like gluten allergy or gluten intolerance, uh, there's a great deal of confusion and misinformation about food allergies and gluten. Gluten intolerance is not a typical food allergy. It's an inherited condition that leads to a mucotoxic or inflammatory response. Gluten intolerance has a genetic basis, meaning it passes from generation to generation. Gluten intolerance is found mostly frequently in those with Irish, English, um, Scottish, Scandinavian, and other Northern European and Eastern European heritage. The research study published in the British, Journal, or British Medical Journal in November 1998 found previously unheard numbers of people suffering from celiac disease, the medical condition related to gluten intolerance. They found approximately 1 in 150 people with this condition. It is suspected the levels of subclinical gluten intolerance are much higher, perhaps as high as 1 in 3 Americans. Subclinical gluten intolerance in celiac occur less frequently in non-European populations. It's important to note that many people who are gluten intolerant do not test positive on food allergy testing for wheat, rye, barley, and other gluten-containing grains. Do not be misled by the fact that you are that you do not test positive to these gluten-containing foods. You still must avoid the offending gluten foods if you are gluten intolerant. Many people live 30 or 40 years with subclinical gluten intolerance and do not experience obvious symptoms. Some people who are constitutionally strong and eat small amounts of gluten-containing foods may never experience obvious symptoms at all. But however, however, with or without obvious symptoms, intestinal damage is still taking place and this, like I have said before, puts more stress on our stress hormone response, which makes our immune system poor. So along with gluten intolerance comes with food cravings. And it has frequently been observed that people crave that which they are allergic to. So please take note, if you crave gluten, breads, you know, uh, pastries, sugary type things, there's a high possibility or high probability that you are gluten sensitive. All right, bugs, what about infections? We talked about um, what gluten can do or subclinical gluten intolerance can do to the GI tract. What does that mean when we have this low-grade inflammation and it affects our immune system? So how does that set us up for chronic infections? And this is a big, big deal that we see in our practice. The structural changes to the small intestine from gluten intolerance create the perfect habitat for development of pathogenic infections. Inflammation in the small intestine causes a structure called crypts to deepen, like a big uh, canyon. These elongating, or the elongation of these crypts, uh, referred to as crypt hyperplasia, and deepening of the crypts make for a deep pocket where a pathogen such as parasite can survive by evading the usual immune surveillance that uh, lines the, the GI tissue. Inflammation also slowly destroys the immune cells that help protect this area. And these two factors taken together create a situation where parasite infections can take hold and become chronic. Parasites deeply embed, embedded in the intestinal lining can even be resistant to powerful antibiotic treatments. Because of this, people with gluten intolerance need to rule out the possibility that they are harboring a chronic parasitic infection. Eliminating gluten from their diet can be the first step in getting these chronic infections cleared. But this is why in our office we stress testing your GI function for any chronic infections like parasites. Or else the situation just keeps snowballing and gets worse. So candida or yeast infections. There's a relationship between yeast infections, also called candida, which is an opportunistic organism in the gastrointestinal tract, and food intolerances. There's a big relationship between the two. Inflammation caused by subclinical gluten intolerance and or lactose intolerance weakens the immune response in the intestinal lining. This weakened mucosal immune defense can open the door for candida to overpopulate and become invasive candida. 
So invasive basically means to invade and attach itself to the healthy lining of the intestines. Gluten intolerance causes multiple nutritional deficiencies, including inability to absorb fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. Malabsorption of fats leads to deficiencies in the fat-soluble vitamins, such as vitamin A, E, vitamin K, and importantly, the essential fatty acids from which we manufacture all of our reproductive hormones and our adrenal hormones, including estrogen, testosterone, progesterone, cortisol, and DHEA. Other nutritional deficiencies that appear early in the disease process include lack of calcium, folic acid, iron, and vitamin B12. Lack of reproductive hormones leads to disruption of the normal menstrual cycle, causing PMS or menopausal symptoms. The combination of calcium deficiency and female hormone imbalances leads to osteoporosis or weakening of the bones. Even if women take estrogen and calcium supplements, they may not be adequately absorbed. Folic acid, B12, and iron deficiencies lead to anemia, depression, and increased risk of heart disease and neurological diseases. Finally, the lack of antioxidants, vitamin E and vitamin A, compromise our ability to fight free radicals and can further contribute to degeneration conditions such as cancer and heart disease. So I could go on with the examples um, with nutritional deficiencies linked to gluten intolerance, but basically the take-home message is we can have subclinical gluten intolerance where we don't have any symptoms, but it drives this low-grade inflammatory response. Our shag carpet, our villi on the intestines, slowly gets damaged, and we therefore we don't absorb the essential nutrients that we need anymore. Because of that, progressing longer, we may and it sets us up for infections, which furthers the problem, but also contributes to other um, symptoms and uh, diseases. Because these nutritional deficiencies over time is what leads to these diseases we see on other you know lab work and uh, with other symptomatology. So we have to step back and we have to say, is it truly our symptoms and disease, a nutritional you know, deficiency problem? Am I taking the wrong multivitamin? Is that the only problem? Or is there something deeper up the road or more involved that has to do with our digestion and our absorption? And if so, what is that? Is it our um, intolerance to certain foods? Is it um, chronic infections? Is it a poor immune response, et cetera? So I hope this description and this, this kind of detailed explanation of gluten intolerance um, has been helpful. The goal for me is to show you and to explain to you that this is not just a fad, that gl gl eliminating gluten is not just uh, something that is the, the new trend and something that's popular to do or a weight loss thing. It's more for your health. There's a bigger and more complex reason behind it, and the goal of this was to help you uh, show you that and explain the connections between nutritional deficiencies and being subclinically gluten intolerant.